What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today we're gonna to be discussing the care and pathophysiology of hypertension. Let's get started. So to begin, what is the story with blood pressure? Why is blood pressure so important? So the definition of blood pressure is, it's, it's the pressure of the blood in the circulatory system often measured for diagnosis since it's closely related to the force and rate of the heartbeat and the diameter and elasticity of the arterial walls. So how do we know what blood pressure is? What makes up our blood pressure? Well, blood pressure is made up of our cardiac output and our systemic vascular resistance, also known as our SVR. So when it comes to cardiac output, that's the amount of blood your heart pumps out each minute. And when it comes to our systemic vascular resistance, that's the resistance in the circulatory system that is used to create blood pressure. So think about it this way. When the vessels are constricted, right, this is going to lead to an increase in SVR, also an increase in our blood pressure. However, if our vessels, or, I'm sorry, our vessels are dilated, such as with vasodilation, you see a lot with our sepsis patients, that's going to lead to a decrease in SVR, also known as hypotension. So what are some important factors affecting our blood pressure? Well, one, it's our systolic blood pressure. That's how much pressure is exerted against the arterial walls when the heart contracts. That's the squeeze that's occurring in our blood vessels. Next, we have our diastolic blood pressure, and that's how much pressure is exerted against the arterial walls when the heart is resting between beats. That's that dilation relaxation of our blood vessels. And then lastly, we have our mean arterial pressure. This is a really important thing to know. That's your MAP. This is the average pressure in the patient's arteries during one cardiac cycle. It's also highly used as an indicator of whether our vital organs are being perfused or not. So typically you want to see a map greater than 65. So traditionally, when you're looking at the normal values when it comes to blood pressure, you're usually looking at but somewhere with systolic at 120 and somewhere with your diastolic at 80. And that's how we get that 65 map. So as you're taking care of your critical patients, make sure that you always note the map being greater than 65 and your systolic being greater than 100. So let's talk about normal ranges when it comes to blood pressure. So according to the 2017 American Heart Guidelines, this is what they categorize blood pressures under. So when it comes to a normal blood pressure, you're going to see a blood pressure less than 120 systolically and less than 80 diastolically. So that's where we got before we talked about our 120 over 80. When we start to see blood pressure elevation, we're looking at systolically between 120 and 129 and diastolically less than 80. So we still wanna keep that resting pressure less than 80, right? When we officially hit hypertension, which is that high blood pressure, we break that down into three stages. We have stage one, stage two, and then we move on to a hypertensive crisis. So beginning with stage one, we're looking at a systolic blood pressure between 130 and 139 and a diastolic blood pressure between 80 to 89. We really don't um, overly concern ourselves with hypertension until we hit stage two. So once we hit stage two of hypertension, we're looking at blood pressure systolically greater than 140 and diastolic diastolically greater than 90. So that's usually when we start to worry a little bit about what's going on. However, if we don't treat the hypertension, we can eventually develop a hypertensive crisis, which is going to result in the patient being hospitalized. So when we're looking at that, we're looking at a systolic blood pressure higher than 180 and a diastolic blood pressure greater than 120. So once hypertensive crisis hits, at that point, when it comes to nursing interventions, we're looking to evaluate brain and cardiac damage. So now let's take a look at the causes when it comes to hypertension. So that's that high tension that's occurring in the arteries as well as the heart and the vital organs. So we break that down into two categories. We have primary hypertension and we have secondary hypertension. So when it comes to primary hypertension, there's not going to be a specific cause noted with these patients. The only thing that we can look at is non-modifiable and modifiable um, 
issues that we can change, right? So when it comes to non-quantifiable that we can't change, we're looking at age, we're looking at race, um, African Americans and Native American Indians tend to have a higher risk for hypertension, and we look at genetics and family factors. When it comes to modifiable, those are the things that we can change. Um, physical inactivity, if the patient has obesity, um, excessive alcohol use and sodium intake, we can greatly reduce those. And then lastly, smoking, because as we know, smoking narrows the blood vessels, blood vessels I'm sorry, and makes them very stiff. So we can change those things when it comes to primary hypertension. Now, when it comes to secondary hypertension, those are going to be caused by disease processes. So these are secondary to some kind of disease process. So you're looking at, uh, to begin with, diabetes. Diabetes messes up everything, right? So diabetes will absolutely cause a vascular disorder that could lead to hypertension. Cardiovascular diseases, when we have like a fluid retention problem because we have a broken pump, like with um, heart failure or cardiogenic shock, um, you can see hypertension with those. Um, renal diseases, you know, you want to keep fluid in that body, right? So um, when it comes to renal diseases, the renals are like, hey, I'm not working appropriately. I can't get this fluid out. And now I'm retaining all of this fluid. And with all this extra fluid in the body not being able to be excreted through your urine, it's going to cause um, some kind of hypertension. And then lastly, pregnancy absolutely can be a cause of hypertension. So let's look at hypertension symptoms. So when it comes to early symptoms, patients are typically not going to show any warning signs. That's the reason that hypertension is called the silent killer, because in the beginning, you're not going to experience anything. You will go about your regular day and you will not know that you are hypertensive. When it comes to late signs, we can see angina. So that's that um, pressure, that crushingness in the chest that you feel, that, that heart pain. That's usually caused by effects on the heart. That's very common. You start to see visual changes. So again, hypertension affects the blood vessels in the eyes. It affects the blood vessels everywhere. So that's going to be another common thing that you will see. Um, dizziness can also occur because of the constriction on the brain. And then lastly, frequent headaches absolutely can be a common risk factor and common late sign um, because it's caused by, you know, those effects on the brain. And then lastly, if it's not treated appropriately and it continues to fester, you start to see end organ damage as well as failure in your kidneys, your heart. You can even develop stroke um, as well as a myocardial infarction. So it's really important that when you're taking care of this patient population that you stress the importance of them checking their blood pressure daily or um, at least seeing their doctor annually to make sure that they don't have any kind of hypertension taking place. Because as we know, blood pressure changes are really gradual in nature. You don't um, have a blood pressure of 220 over 140 overnight, right? That's why it's called the silent killer. It invades while you have no symptoms. So gradually over time that blood pressure is going to build up and then typically patients don't actually go seek help until they start to develop symptoms so absolutely stress the importance when you're doing patient education that if they have hypertension to check it daily and that if um, otherwise they're medically okay that they at least follow up with their doctor every year so let's talk about hypertension complications. So we have arterial sclerosis, which is that scarred and hard arteries that occur because of hypertension. There's also a risk of aneurysm development. That's that blood vessel damage. And if it gets so damaged that it can eventually rupture, so that would be a ruptured aneurysm, um, could be a cause of hypertension or a complication of hypertension. Um, broken kidneys, broken heart, and eye damage, absolutely. We talked about before when it comes to our um, late signs with hypertension that you're absolutely going to start to develop some kind of end organ damage or at least some kind of damage to your organs. So you have this massive pressure on all of your organs, right? So this hypertension is clamping down on these arteries. It's causing this massive pressure on your vital organs. So you're going to start to see that renal failure, retinopathy when it comes to your eyes, neuropathy, as well as heart failure. And then lastly, a huge complication of hypertension are clots, right? So if the heart can't pump effectively because of all that vasoconstriction that's happening throughout the body, you're 
going to start to build up clots in your heart. And if those clots get out when they're eventually pushed out into the body, there's a couple of different things that can occur, right? We can have clots in our lungs, also known as a pulmonary embolism, a clot in our brain, also known as a stroke, and then lastly, a clot in our heart, which is known as a myocardial infarction. So what are some diagnostic testing that we can do when it comes to hypertension? Well, we can get a chest x-ray to look and see what's going on with our heart. Is our heart becoming enlarged? Is there something going on uh, between our lungs and our heart? Do we have congestion? Those type of things we can find on our chest x-ray. We can do an echocardiogram. So this procedure actually takes a look at the heart structures as well as the ejection fraction. So typically we like to see an ejection fraction between 55 to 70%. That's within normal. Once we start getting out of those uh, normals, we start to see damage or poor perfusion to our heart and our body. And then lastly, we can do an ECG, also known as an EKG. It's basically an electrocardiogram, and you could potentially see tall peaked R waves, depending on how severe that vasoconstriction is when it comes to hypertension. So now that we know about imaging, what are we gonna do about our lab work, right? When it comes to the diagnostics of hypertension. So we have our B-type natriuretic peptides, also known as BNP. And this tells us the stretch that's happening within our ventricles. So if we have a value between 100 or anywhere less than that, then we're looking at a normal value when it comes to our BNP. Um, once we start getting into that 300 plus, we're looking at mild issues, 600 plus moderate, and 900 plus very severe. So you're gonna see this highly elevated when it comes to our congestive heart failure patients, um, just because there is this str massive stretch that is happening within the ventricles. Another thing that we can get is our C-reactive protein. This is going to tell us the total body chronic inflammation that's happening systemically. And then lastly, cholesterol panels. You know, how clogged are our arteries? What is that risk factor when it comes to hypertension? So when it comes to total cholesterol, we really want a number 200 or less. When it comes to triglycerides, we want a number 150 or less. When it comes to our low density lipoproteins, also known as our LDL, that's our bad cholesterol, we want that to be 100 or less. And then lastly, when it comes to high density lipoprotein, that's our HDL, that's that good stuff that we want. We want that to be 40 or more. All right. Now that we know everything about hypertension and how to diagnose it, how are we gonna treat it? What does the management look like? So we're gonna begin by looking at our medication choices. So something that's important to note before we go through this is that when it comes to blood pressure management, this may require multiple medications to be given at once in order to treat the hypertension appropriately. So you're looking at maybe sometimes two medications being given at once. So it's not a one size fits all when it comes to medications. That's something that doctors are going to trial with patients until they find out what works. So to begin, we have ACE inhibitors, also known as our PRILs. So what they do is they decrease that water retention and cause vasodilation. As we know, hypertension is causing this vasoconstriction to occur, and ACE inhibitors will help with that vasodilation. So an example of this could be lisinopril. You're going to probably see that a lot in practice. Uh, next, you're going to see angiotensin II receptor blockers, also known as your ARBs. Um, those end in sartan. So again, they do the exact same thing that the ACE inhibitors do. They decrease that water retention and cause that vasodilation. And they're usually given to patients when they develop a cough taking ACE inhibitors. So ARBs are not always the first choice, but they do the exact same thing as the ACE inhibitors. They just work on a different part of our RAS system. Um, and when patients develop this horrible cough when they're taking these ACE inhibitors, they will eventually switch to these ARBs to kind of help um, alleviate those symptoms caused by the previous medication. So something that you might see a lot in practice with these is they're called Losartan. So those are gonna be your a um, ARBs. Next, we move on to our beta blockers and that's our LALs. So what they do is they decrease the heart rate. So they block the heart's beats and contractility to decrease the blood pressure. Typically, the most common one that you're gonna see is metoprolol. They also have other different medications, but this is the one most commonly used in practice. Um, next, calcium channel blockers. Those are your pines. That every, they all end in pines. So what they do is they help relax the smooth muscle causing vasodilation. So calcium channel blockers 
calm the heart, right? And that's when you're gonna see your amlodipines. Um, those are common medications when it comes to calcium channel blockers. And then lastly, we have diuretics. So what does diuretics do? Those medications and eyes, by the way, and they decrease that circulating volume in the body. So it's gonna help eliminate some of that extra fluid like we had talked about before. Sometimes, depending on what's happening in the body where the damage is occurring, if the kidneys are taking a hit, the kidneys are not gonna be able to work appropriately to release all of that extra fluid. So these diuretics will help with that. And you're gonna see that a lot um, with different various medications. You could have furosemide, um, you could have spirolactone. There's a whole bunch of different medications. Something that's important to note before we move on to um, lifestyle changes and things that the patient can do is that when it comes to diuretics, you really have to be careful with what the patient's potassium is in the body, right? So if the patient's potassium is really low, you don't want to give potassium wasting diuretics like furosemide because that's only going to impede the uh, potassium from being able to go up, right? So you can give potassium, 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 but if you're continuously giving furosemide, it's not gonna make much of a difference when it comes to that potassium. So something that's important um, that you can speak with a physician about is looking at potassium sparing diuretics such as spirolactone. So just something important to keep in the back of your head if you have a patient that chronically has hypokalemia, which is that low potassium, and they are on potassium wasting diuretics, it might be time for you to have a conversation about looking at potassium sparing diuretics um, until we can fix the potassium issue. So lastly, let's move on to hypertension education. So when it comes to hypertension, it is absolutely 100% preventable with just making a few changes in the individual themselves. So to begin with, let's look at lifestyle changes. So we talked about before when it comes to smoking, that's a huge risk factor. So we want to educate on that cessation of smoking. Um, stress reduction, if you know, you're know you stressed out, it's going to cause hormones release that can inevitably clamp your um, arteries, causing hypertension. So trying to reduce stress, finding coping mechanisms to help with stress. And then of course, medication management and compliance. There has been too many times that patients are readmitted to the hospital because of poor medication management and compliance when it comes to their pills. Um, like we talked about before, hypertension is a silent killer. So as they start taking medications and those symptoms start to go away, patients usually say, oh, well, I'm feeling much better. I shouldn't have to take these medications anymore, right? And they stop taking their medications and inevitably end up back in the hospital. So it's very important that even though symptoms may go away, um, medication management and compliance is very important. Um, dietary changes. So decreasing that sodium intake, usually known as the DASH diet, will be very helpful with our hypertension patients. Decreasing caffeine as well as alcohol intake. And then if they are physically inactive, making sure that they start to have some kind of physical activity so they can decrease the weight as well as their obesity. And then lastly, blood pressure monitoring is so important. They really need to be following up with their physician annually or more often, depending on how severe the hypertension is. You know, following up with cardiology when it's absolutely necessary and then continuous home blood pressure monitoring daily, every three days, whatever the physician recommends to make sure that they're not going into those high, high risk hypertensions. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding hypertension, care, and pathophysiology. If you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe here on YouTube and turn on that bell notification so that you're informed every time I post a new video. Head over to nursechung.com where there's additional information as well as resources when it comes to this lecture. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will see you all again soon. Bye.